Hello, everybody, and welcome to Frankenstein Chat. And uh, as you can see, it's not just Frankenstein uh, today. We have got Raksha Patney with us. Hello, Raksha. Uh, hi, Frank, and hi, Stan. Hi. <laughs> yeah, we'll do the. We'll uh, let everybody know. We'll ask Raksha to just uh, introduce herself in a in a minute. Um, so, uh, Stan, um, how are you this morning? Um, yeah, uh, not bad. Not better bad. things, better things have happened, but yeah, we're okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I've uh, had a sort of uh, an up and down week as well, but uh, there is some good news in the in the news this week, uh, as well as some very unusual things happening, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, but Raksha, uh, welcome. And uh, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself and tell everybody who you are? Yeah, sure. I just want to start by saying I feel like a mini celebrity. I don't think I've been <laughs> on any chat shop before in my life. So, and the second thing to say is that I know you were in Colombia last Friday. Yes. So uh, from that to Lancashire. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, hi to all, all the listeners out there. So um, I'm I'm Raksha Patney, um, and I currently work for a national education charity called Ambition Institute, uh, which exists to address uh, education uh, disadvantage and ensure that every child, regardless of their background, um, has a great education. So uh, that's a bit of background on on myself. Brilliant. And um, uh, Raksha and I, uh, when I worked for the Carp Academies Trust, um, we did work with Ambition. And Raksha is also, just so that people are aware, um, on the Education Committee of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, of which I'm also a member. So that we we don't meet that often now. We used to meet quite a lot during lockdown, didn't we? The, the first lockdown. Every week. Every week. Every week, wasn't it? When we were trying to find laptops and devices for communities and trying to Absolutely. find solutions, I think um it was it was our thinking that brought forward the the tutoring program absolutely um, okay so um stan what's caught your eye this week well a lot of things have caught my eye but uh, i'll steer away from the uh from the piers morgan interview with uh gary williamson um i'll just keep that on the back burner um the one to me was when you think nothing else can go wrong the laptops that have gone out to schools <laughs> Some of them have a, um, a virus on that are connecting the, the children's laptop to some servers in Russia and downloading data about them. I mean, how many things can you get wrong and still remain uh, in charge? Yeah. I just I find it incredible. I mean, it's 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 good to see laptops being delivered to schools, <laughs> but there is. Are they being sponsored by some Russian <laughs> oligarch who's, who's taking everyone's details? It's just bizarre. Oh. Raksha, what caught your eye this week? So, um, I there were two things. I mean, I have to mention the inauguration. Yes of President Biden and uh, and to see Kamala Harris making history as the first woman and the uh, first uh, black and South Asian American to take uh, that uh, position as vice president. That was awesome. I feel the world is a little bit safer this week uh, than last week. Um, and I was also in awe of the young poet laureate, uh, Amanda oh. Gorman, as she recited her uh, The Hill We Climb. I just thought uh, that was awesome. Um, and the second story that caught my eye is actually about this uh, digital divide. So we all heard about Marcus Rashford and you know the campaign he's been running. And uh, so this one is uh, Maro Itoje, the English rugby player, 26-year-old oh, yes. uh, who wants computers and free broadband in the homes of 1.78 million um, children. And I, I just think it's fantastic when like sports superstars come out and start to really get behind some of these really, really important um, causes as well. Um, so that caught my eye. Uh, and then if I can have a third one. Go on then, as, as the guest. <laughs> so as, as, a, as a Bond fan, I was really uh, disappointed that they've now delayed 
the uh, uh, the launch, the premiere of the latest movie to October. I've been waiting since uh, last April. <laughs> yeah, and apparently cinemas are desperate for that film, aren't they? Just to get, yeah. and also desperate to reopen. Exactly. Um, for me, um, I, I mean, I have to say the inauguration. Um, yeah. It, it just had a certain um, security about it, not just in terms of safety, but there was a a firmness of approach and uh, a clarity of thinking and just a sureness of touch, which uh, I think uh, were lacking from the previous administration. And uh, and also sort of highlights, it will highlight, I think, um, effective governance and government. And that that's uh, something that I think the issues around laptops, the issues around you know, the, the, we say the government that keep on giving to this channel. Um, I think it's going to highlight significantly, unless they step up, um, the government are going to be shown up by the, the American administration um, because they just look competent. I mean, um, so I think that for me... Is that a minimum standard, Frank? Well, it's... <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, it, it, well, it, it should be, should it? But actually, I think the thing is, is that, um, you know, we, we all deserve to be confident in our leadership, in our, in our leaders and, uh, and what they do and how they act. And I think the issue was around, um, um, you know, just this sense of truth, truthfulness and honesty being at the heart that you can take that as being read. You feel as though you can take that as being read with Biden. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that for me carries you through some of the difficult decisions because you accept that there will be some very painful decisions to be made. But there is a, a certain sort of uh, value system that underpins that, which where, whereby you might not fully agree with the decision making, but actually you have sufficient confidence in the individual to, to be making the right decision for the nation. And I'm not sure, I, I, I certainly don't have that same level of confidence at the moment about um, this government. But anyway, yeah, I, I think for me, I really took away that uh, message of um, unity uh, and hope. Yes. And I think like, I have a family in, in America as well. And I must admit, I was really worried for, for them and for their safety. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, I think Biden will have like really huge challenges at his hands. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, unity, and then obviously there's COVID as well. I mean, it's interesting um, you talk about family because um, when we we chatted um, last weekend in in anticipation of this, and I think one of the things you said was that you were keen to to convey a bit of your your life story in a way to to use that as a, a vehicle for encouragement for other. Um, but, yeah, perhaps women, but other other individuals who who are facing ordeals and and troubles, you know, and see that as a as an example of how you can overcome them. So uh, I think it's interesting. Would you like to tell Stan what you know? Wh where did all this start? You know, where did where where's your family? Where were you born? That's probably the place. Yeah, sure. So I, I um, so Stan, I am I'm really fascinated uh, by people's life journeys and how that shapes them um, and 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 their careers. Um, and um, so for me, I was um, I was born and brought up in Tanzania, which is part of like East Africa. So it's a neighboring country to Kenya um, and Uganda. Um, and I, I grew up in a very much a, a kind of a multicultural uh, society, neighborhood, in a very much a multilingual uh, kind of uh, um, uh, surrounding. So uh, at home we sp spoke Gujarati, but Tanzania's national language was Swahili. So all my um, education was in Swahili. And then we had an hour's uh, foreign language lesson, and that was... Um, uh, English. And I remember uh, the place where we lived, a place called Tabora, which has quite strong links with Livingston. And uh, we had like a temple at one end, there was a church, there was a Gurudwara, there was a mosque, and it wasn't unheard of for all of us to celebrate all the festivals <laughs> um, together. 
uh, you know, so I remember celebrating Eid, Baisaki, Christmas, um, and even in terms of my education was really different. And it was quite a shock to my system when I came to UK. So for example, in my class, I would have like 50 onwards between 50 and 60 children in a classroom. And some of the children were much older than I was, you know, sometimes even up to five years older. And that's just because that's when they could start their schooling and it was acceptable. It wasn't really regimented uh, like it was. Uh, my, um, both of my pa parents um, uh, kind of grew, their, uh, like they ran their own business. They worked really hard. They ran their own business, but, but, but were very philanthropic in, in the way they were and really committed to serving the local community. So I would often see them donating clothes and food to the local orphanage or actually uh, paying for like books and resources for local schools or paying for uh, the cost of teacher training. And it was because they believed that education was really key and was the root uh, uh, out of poverty uh, and uh, disadvantage, but it really opened up. Um, so, so what brought you what brought the family to England then? What, what were the events that led to that? Um, so it was, um, so Tanzania and Uganda went to war. And uh, when it went to war, uh, Tanzania basically um, really suffered as a result, as, as any country would do. You know, it had a, a major like economic depression. There was a lot of unemployment. Uh, it became a lawless uh, country. Um, a lot of the civilians who were turned into the army and were armed with weapons came back with those weapons. And, you know, so it, there's a lot of civil unrest. And uh, my family, uh, my, my parents who were both born in Africa, my father in Tanzania, my mother in Kenya, uh, it was a really hard decision for them to make, but they decided that it wasn't safe for me uh, to be there. And I remember that actually it was myself and my grandmother who was in her early 90s. We came on our own uh, to UK and I already had family here. But I remember it was, well, anyway, to me, it was like overnight decision. I just had to pack really? one bag wow. uh, because wow. what Tanzania were, had learned was that they were almost like closing their borders. They didn't want their residents to leave. Like what happened with Uganda when Uganda had all the issues, all the Asians left and then the country really suffered and Tanzania didn't want that to happen. Right. So they, um, but at the same time, it was really unsafe. So uh, I came to UK uh, at the age of 14 and I came under the premises that I was just coming for a holiday and I was going back. So, so were you fluent um, in English? Did you, was your English, you know, secure and, you, you know, you, you understood you were able to write in English or, you know, what level were you at when you joined? So um, we had a really, ma uh, like a really big library at home because I have six other sisters. Wow. And so there was lots of, so I did, I did lots of reading, but I, I tell you where I really, really struggled and it was the slang, the accent, yeah? yeah? So when I came here, when people were asking me if I wanted grub, I'm like, grub? What, what does grub mean? <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. like, you know, so I, 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 so my accent was different. I, I, and, you know, I couldn't really understand people's accent because, you know, when you're being taught English as a foreign language, uh, by a, a non-English speaker, it's uh, it's where. So I, I'm, so I, I, I would say that my reading was really in a strong place um, and spelling, uh, but I would say that like understanding people was uh, quite a difficulty. Well, and, I have to say that's that's the same if you live in the UK. If you if you live in Wigan, you can't understand the people from Bolton or, or Lancashire <laughs> <laughs> or Yorkshire. <laughs> So where, where did you move? Where were your uh, family roots and in England? So it was in um, Leicester, 
Okay. Uh, and, and as you, you might know, Leicester is where like a lot of the East African uh, mm. uh, Asian community live in Leicester. So that's uh, where it, it came my home. And I remember it, it was August, I arrived and then within two weeks, um, I had to sit an exam and then I went to an all um, girls school uh, and and that was like was that, was that, how, how, was, how, how was how was that then I mean was it so it was, it was yeah it was a real eye opener so for a starter like the class size was such a small for me like about 20 and I was used to like a like over 50 or 60 in a classroom uh, and uh, uh, and then oh, in Tanzania we started our school day by actually cleaning the school so as well as your school bag you have to take a broom and all the cleaning kit really? with you right wow. so it, it might now feel familiar with COVID but that's like you spend an hour and if you're really unlucky, you get chosen to clean the toilet. And that was like every child's nightmare. Like, <laughs> please don't choose us to do that. Uh, but so, so I was like, wow, this is fantastic. I don't have any of that. And actually, I've got more attention here from the, my teacher. She's like, uh, knows exactly what I'm doing where I could get away with a few more things. Uh, so, so all that was uh, uh, really different. Uh, for me and uh, yeah just uh, the climate you know they, they, they're like obvious things but like the whole way of life culture was um, uh, quite different and and I think for me sometimes you know like you have these big transitions like for me now I have a, a, a two, uh, two young boys and I would absolutely dread to send them to another different continent and mm. expect them to start a school without me because my parents couldn't join me straight away there was quite a long gap before they could join me I lived with my uncle and aunt um, and uh, yeah so to wow. think like sometimes you go through these transitions but are you actually it, it's fine you come out of it yeah it's interesting because my father I think I mentioned to you before that my father-in-law was Anglo-Indian and uh, uh, and after the partition they were anxious about their the family safety so the family sent um, him to North Manchester um, where he stayed with um, one of the soldiers who they'd put up during the war but actually that must have been he was 18 you know I mean the thought of that having to go on the boat you know with one suitcase to a place in North Manchester, and it was winter, um, you know, to meet a soldier's family who had never met him before, and then, to, you know, and then to actually set up home there. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, nowadays going to university and staying in halls, you know, uh, is seen as a, a major step, you know, a big wrench, but I can't imagine what it was like for the family and for him. I suppose for him, it was just an adventure. You know, I don't think he he saw it in the same way that an adult or an, a parent would see it. But uh, Stan, just as a contrast, I mean, obviously this is a long time before you went to school. When I went to school, um, but my first, the primary school I went to, there were four in my my year group. Not not fit, well, there were probably twenty in the classroom, but only four of my age. And when you said um, Tanzania. We had, I don't know if Frank had the same experience, a, a, a guy called Major Colburn, who used to come in once a term with slideshow of Africa, his, his, his trip through Africa. I think it was, was it Tanganyika? Is that the same place? Yeah, it was, correct, yeah. It, it was Tanganyika, and we were fascinated by these slides of wild animals, and chi and that was our experience of what, what Africa as a whole was like it was probably half an hour once a term. <laughs> so, 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 um, Raksha, I mean, in t how how did the students um, did the students accept you? You know, how welcoming was how welcoming was the school in England? Um, so, I, I uh, actually I found my primary education here really hard. I found it quite hard to fit in. Um, and I think um, partly because I think there was the, there is a, I think people have their own uh, 
conceptions and uh, prejudices and stereotypes and um, and I, I I remember being asked if like I, I lived in a jungle and with Tarzans and you know so and like and it was it was really weird trying to explain that and and actually I it, you know it it was it wasn't obviously as developed as here but we certainly didn't have that and it, it was like I described it was really multicultural and you know like we had really very strong like friendships with our Muslim neighbors and Sikh neighbors and and uh, some of the women uh, that were around you know they were like uh, doctors lawyers you know so it, it was actually it, it was here that I found when coming here how it was segregated and you know some of the stereotypes that existed for Asian women, uh, and it hadn't really struck me. So it was just like trying to kind of how you um, uh, increase awareness of where you've come, and actually it's not. And sometimes it can be really exhausting uh, to get uh, over that. But yeah, because my accent was really different, and I probably wasn't in the same sort of fashion sense with it. It, it was really hard to begin with. But I would say that by the time I went to um, uh, college, I, I have got really fond memories of like college and university life than I would say my earlier education here. Yeah. So, I mean, in a sense, uh, in terms of your career development then, um, have you found that your Tanzanian experiences and your general sort of fight, you know, the grit that you've had to show, you know, has that put you in good stead for some of those challenges that you've faced? I, I would definitely uh, uh, say so. And I think I, I am really passionate about creating positive change in society and social mobility. And I've been very fortunate to have worked for um, uh, very powerful mission-driven um, charities. And I would definitely say this is uh, the, it's my upbringing, the experiences I've been through as, as a child, but also growing, watching how my parents were so committed uh, to the, the local community. And I remember when I left university, I was all, almost destined to have a career in finance. And I just like that just didn't appeal to me. And like so many young people now, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I feel that the experience that I went through gave me the courage to take a year out, which in, in those days, in my days, in my family, just wasn't the thing to be done. You go from one thing to another to another. And I took a year out. I did some voluntary work with a, an environmental charity in Leicester, and that really fired my passion for uh, the charity sector. So Stan, I mean, in terms of your sort of uh, journey towards education, you know, I don't know if you you clearly didn't have to move continents to uh, to develop no. your career, but I mean, were were there moments like ratchets where actually this was quite influential? This has sort of sort of shaped me in terms of who I am as a as an educationalist. Well, I think um, I'd have to say that the, the the upbringing. My dad was an engineer. My mum didn't work until I was about ten when she became a teacher. But that was much against my dad's um, upbringing. You know, he he was the breadwinner. Mm. She shouldn't work. So there was a lot of tension in the house when she trained as a teacher. Um, and I was was expected to become an engineer. That that was that was the way that the the thing was set up. Uh, and I think it was influence at sixth form that made me interested in what was going on in schools. Mm. And I, I went from sixth form to college straight into. Uh, into teaching. It's, I have a similar one because my 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 mother was Irish. Uh, she came over when she was about 16, 17 to be a maid in uh, in London. And my father um, had um, he he it wasn't a great upbringing. So he was I suppose what they call undernourished. So he went into an open air school and it was one of those schools where they'd will you out on a bed. Yeah. put you on a sort of like a, a balcony to give you some fresh air <laughs> some therapy. yeah yeah um so uh, he missed a lot of his schooling so he he couldn't read or write um so he went on the uh 
the Ford uh, production line in Basildon making radiator parts. Mm. And so his, his vision for my future was to join him on the line because a lot of his mates, the, 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 the lads in the family did that, particularly the, the, the oldest man or boy in the family. But I remember my mother saying, um, you know, over my, she used to say, whenever it was really serious, over my dead body. <laughs> and so uh, it was her that uh, uh, encouraged me to, to go and study uh, sixth form at the grammar school, and uh, uh, which wasn't a very happy experience. But I, I, I do think that the reasons why I, I taught were primarily because a guy from the grammar school um, had that year out. He had a year out before he went to train to be a teacher. So he was only 18. And he taught us uh, history O level syllabus, and I, I, I'm still friendly with him now. I still communicate with him, Dave Mill. Um, but he's a, an, it was amazing natural teacher and just loved history. So that got me into history, and that was I think very influential in terms of my uh, my future career. Well, I can remember Frank just to, to the career teacher at the grammar school I was at, because at that point I wanted to be an aeronautical engineer. I'd written off to BOAC, shows how old, how long ago it was, <laughs> to say that's, I wanted an apprenticeship being that. And, and he took me on one side and said, do you know, I think you would earn a lot more money putting wheels on cars in a car factory. That's where you should be. Heading. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, believe it or not, I said this, didn't I, Raksha, that it just did. flash. We're nearly half an hour into our chat um, and we're going to bring it to a close. But there is some music that we're using at the uh, beginning of this uh, uh, Frankenstein chat, which has been specially composed uh, or at least created. So do you want to just tell us a little bit about um, who it is that's uh, created this piece of music? Yeah, sure. So uh, the music's uh, created by Rohan. Uh, so Rohan is my son. He's soon to be uh, 18. And he has a big passion for uh, music and music production. Um, so uh, yeah, he just spends hours and hours creating music and he's hoping to uh, go to university to uh, study uh, music production. Uh, and last time we spoke, there was loud there was, music banging this, away in the there background. There was this bass that was shaking the house. You, you, yes. know, what my, you know, that's what my son did. Yeah. My son yeah. went to Salford University to do uh, music production and uh, wow. music, I think his, his degree was. Um, and they did say at the start of the course, if you're on this course with the hope of getting a career and a job, you're on the wrong course. <laughs> <laughs> he now teaches music. He's uh, he's, he's um, teaching assistant now. He, he had a, a period where he was a peripatetic music teacher. Now he works in a school because he prefers working with a team than working on his own. Yeah. Uh, but he's very happy and he's still producing music. So I will have to get Rohan to speak to your son. Yeah. <laughs> Please do get in touch. I'm sure he will. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Raksha, for uh, for sharing your story with us. It's been fascinating. And uh, Stan, I hope the news for you is uh, is better uh, later today. Yeah, uh, not um, that hopeful, to be no, honest. But well, let's yeah, um, keep smiling, chin up, and we'll yeah. be back all being well um, next week. So thank you all for joining us. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Oh, no, it's pleasure. been a pleasure, Raksha, our pleasure. Absolute pleasure.